that. And then let me Now, uh, right, let me uh, spotlight Eric. Perfect. There we go. Thank you, Eric. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Providence Art Club, for allowing me to share uh, my art making process with fellow artists and the general public. Um, as Michael introduced me, I'm Eric Telfort. I'm a first generation um, Haitian American practicing fine artist, illustrator, and educator. And uh, on occasion, I'm a world-renowned salsa dancer, but that's only within the confines of my kitchen floor or a classroom before um, my students arrive. Um, I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and I'm currently an associate professor at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, where I also serve as the department chair in illustration. Uh, I teach multiple subjects across illustration, um, ranging from character design um, for entertainment industries, uh, painting, drawing, and digital illustration. I'm gonna stop video so that I can not distract you with my face while um, I do the slideshow. And then I'll reappear um, when I give you a little brief uh, demo of my painting um, practice and some of the tools I use. So let me stop video and I'm gonna share my screen. Can you guys see the screen? All right, so I'm gonna be sharing with you my somewhat unorthodox way of painting that borrows from multiple art disciplines. Um, this image is of me uh, simulating what I think is looking smooth and unassuming with varying degrees of success. Uh, I do wear a red tie, by the way, and a white shirt to work. Um, it's sort of my, my teaching costume. Um, so in order to understand uh, my painting process, it's important for me to provide some historical context so, and, and most of my work has been shaped by my experiences growing up in Miami, Florida, my education, um, the video game industry that I participated in for a little while, and the nonprofit world. Um, full disclosure, my work um, and sense of being reeks of my uh, influences. So when I graduated from RISD, I had a brief stint in the gaming industry, and that was followed by an opportunity to enroll in graduate school at the New York Academy of Art. And at the time, I was still fairly new to the practice of painting, having only really taken three classes prior to that in my undergrad, two of which um, provided no real structured method for developing a palette or image making process. Um, the Academy afforded me a space and community of fine arts practitioners who were just as serious about their um, craft as they were about their sort of social and conceptual issues, particularly related to the figure. So up until that point, my historical knowledge or awareness of critical topics in contemporary art was pretty non-existent um, because I grew up completely immersed in the world of uh, the history of comics, video games, and other forms of popular culture. Uh, this painting, titled Entrain by Philip Thomas was the first painting I saw at the Academy that had a profound impact on the way I wanted to make images. Uh, he, um, Philip um, often spoke about luring people uh, into an image and trapping them in discomfort as the cross-cultural conversations unfolded and kind of revealed themselves. Uh, this painting, um, which is composed of sort of French academic in imagery and contemporary figuration, also speaks to the aftermath of colonialism, particularly in Caribbean countries. Uh, Philip was originally from Jamaica. The painting on the left is titled The Conversation on the Way to Damascus uh, by Caravaggio. And Caravaggio, uh, mostly celebrated for inspiring sort of innovations that led to the popularity of uh, Baroque painting, uh, influenced how I wanted to articulate moments in my paintings. And what interested me about his work specifically was the fact that he had this uncanny ability to create works that captured what I refer to as, or what people refer to as the stillness of a moment. 
It's as if he were taking continuous shots of an event and chose to paint the shot before the shot that was printed, right? Um, the image on the right is widely considered the greatest sports photo of all time. This is an image that was taken by Neil um, Leifer of Muhammad Ali standing over Sonny Liston. And this and that image really embodies this idea of freeze frame, freeze framing, sorry, freeze framing a magnanimous moment, capturing this sort of stillness of the moment. I attempted later on in my time at the Academy to produce a master copy of this painting by Diego Velasquez, and it's titled Juan de Perea. And I uh, attempted this during a master copy class in the MFA in New York. At the time it was painted, um, Velasquez was commissioned to paint Pope Innocent the 10th. And the painting shown here of Juan de Perea was supposed to actually be a warm up, kind of an exercise in, in route to painting um, that painting the next day. Um, ironically, this painting was celebrated more than the painting of the Pope with many contemporaries from that time calling it the truth. Um, some historians attribute the birth of Impressionism to this painting. Um, because of the way it was painted loosely with very expressive, um, quick brush uh, brushwork. Velasquez uh, presented um, this, at the time, his slave um, with a sense of dignity, right? A sense of honest um, humanism and humanity. Although impressionistic in nature, Velasquez went as far as including the details of Pareja's uh, tattered clothes to further signify his earnestness in depicting the truth. So cross-cultural conversation plus the stillness of the moment plus depicting an earnest truth became critical components to the work I wanted to explore. Uh, I developed a series of pieces that re-examined simulations my siblings and I participated in as children as sort of the basis and foundation for the work that I was gonna make. Um, we grew up religious, sheltered, poor, yet very resourceful. Um, I started studying the philosophies on mimesis and came upon a few postmodernist writings by Deleuze and Baudrillard on simulacra and compared their philosophical differences in route to making my work. So simulacra in the art context was examining the relationships between an original work of art and its replication. Eventually the replication would become an accepted truth and the original was no longer relevant. Whereas um, Deleuze argued that the iteration of simulacra was good, Baudrillard argued the loss of the original and the movement towards simulation was bad and had negative consequences. My siblings and I often used our imagination to mimic the Saturday morning cartoon characters we watched on weekends. Um, role play and escapism through other forms of entertainment was an important aspect of our childhood experience. Um, we would take cereal boxes apart to create championship belts to emulate wrestling. We grew up Catholic and we would reenact church scenes, you know, uh, practicing uh, accepting the Eucharist by feeding each other Ritz crackers and drinking juice for wine. Um, the painting here titled Spook was a reenactment of a scene um, from Ghostbusters, a popular cartoon series that we used to watch on Saturday mornings. Now the, now, the simple definition of spook is ghost, and it was also commonly used term in Jim Crow era South to stigmatize uh, Black people. The ghost in the scene has a foot in the shoebox, which represented the containment unit, which was a device that Ghostbusters would use to consume the ghosts. Uh, I remember my sister, uh, my younger sister, lining up my mother's shoes in rows and columns to simulate a classroom. Um, she would uh, tear apart phone book pages and evenly divide them amongst the students. She would go as far as grading papers and chastising these imaginary students, fully consumed in this imaginary world that she was building, right? Um, she would cover her head with t-shirts to get into character of her teachers at the time. And I would observe her going as far as whipping her hair and styling it in between to mimic the actions of her teachers. And I wondered, you know, where did the night, I sort of look back on that now and sort of try to critique that naivety of the characters that we were sort of mimicking. I mean, we tied bed sheets around our necks to transform into superheroes. Uh, this piece is titled Saving the World When I Was Six. Um, it became symbolic for me for several reasons. 
Um, I started realizing my limits when creating some of the pieces that I was um, making at the time. Um, I also started thinking back on sort of the limits of the creativity that we had being sort of stuck between, you know, stuck in those four walls, confined as kids. And I was also realizing that I was becoming a little too dependent on photography. I was basically copying photos um, that were set up to mimic the spaces from my childhood. So I was merely rendering and not really painting, at least not painting like the artists that I was studying at the time. I then rediscovered the work of a contemporary artist, Vincent Desiderio, who was a senior critic at the Academy, but I never really interacted with him when I was at the Academy. Um, we had an exchange when I, when I had revisited during a senior critique, and he actually started challenging me by asking me, you know, he kind of pulled me aside and he said, hey, Eric, have you ever entertained the idea of compositional invention similar to the compositional invention that you experienced and participated in when you were a child. You can also extend this compositional invention to rethinking the way you work with your palette, rethinking the way you work with your materials. And that kind of really inspired me to start experimenting with imagination and memory. Using the photo initially and rejecting it once I had a solid foundation for an image. I developed a recurring character or several recurring characters in my images. One of the characters um, painted here, I named him Haitian Red, which served as sort of a main character in this sort of new make-believe world. I started sort of simulating my simulated worlds at this point. Uh, this image is called Time Out, which was a portrait image of a make-believe character, that make-believe character, Haitian Red, having a contemplative moment. And what made this piece unique for me was, in this case, it was the first time I really wanted the figures that I was painting to confront the viewer. Um, I started working on a series of portraits of imaginary characters whose costumes reflected the resourcefulness of kids and found objects. And it later um, served as sort of the foundation for the newer works that I was producing. I was recently, as Michael mentioned, I was recently awarded the McCall Johnson Fellowship, which provided me resources and supplies to expand on some of the newer directions I've been looking to take um, my work in. The pandemic kind of slowed some of that progress down because of lack of access to certain materials and just prices really going up for um, aluminum dye bond panel, which is the um, surface that I currently um, paint on. So there are countless examples of artists taking advantage of technology to make images. Um, my practice employs using current technology to assist in creating work that allows for a constant sense of discovery and iterative painting practices. Uh, this image uh, is an image by Albrecht Durer in his studio using a perspective machine for drawing. Uh, Durer um, took advantage of science and technology to develop his images. So, you know, I really started realizing that this notion that the old masters were these deities who were above cheating or finding efficient means of helping them create images, I found quite fallacious. And here's an image of my current studio setup. I, I take full advantage of technology to sort of help me build and develop the work that I create. So just to give you a rundown on how I go from sort of start to finish, I usually start with the photo. It's pragmatic. Um, live models are expensive and I also paint at odd times of the day. I also change my mind quite often. Um, so I'll usually try to snap a photo um, of a model as sort of um, a basis to get an idea of where and how I want the figure to be oriented. And from there, I uh, develop the painting using memory and imagination. Now, every now and then I'll, uh, I'll sort of create a few props and I'll light those props and I'll take photos of those props and I paint it. Um, or I'll um, use found objects and paint those from observations. It really is a mixture of different disciplines sort of coming together as one. Um, once I've gone far enough, 
um, as far as I can take the painting, I'll take a photo of the image and transfer it to Photoshop for more exploration. Um, at this point, the photo is, the original photo is um, pretty much rejected and I rely on multiple diverse sources to help fill in the painting and gaps of information. Um, sometimes I'll reference another artist or sometimes I'll use a mirror and paint from observation, especially in things like the feature areas. So at this stage, once I've gotten to this stage where I've used a little bit of computer, um, I've used a few found objects, I've used some photography, I'll typically start an entirely new painting. And this current painting will enter with what I call the incubation period. So I like to consume myself in another project long enough to forget the original piece so that when I come back, it feels fresh. I also like experiencing the world around me and then taking with those experiences, incorporating them into sort of the newer pieces. So at this point in the process, um, I hardly use my original source material for reference. And then the painting sort of develops on its own. And once I'm done with the painting, I'll sort of come to a full stop and sort of go back to the painting that I originally sort of interrupted this painting with. I hope that makes sense. So to be a little more specific on technique, I'll start with the loose drawing on, so if I'm doing a smaller portrait, I'll start uh, a drawing on Bristol board <clears throat> because Bristol board is very archival, it's also very forgiving. And I also really need it just to jot down a few notes. Um, I also paint currently on aluminum dye bond panel, which I like because it's very, it's very stiff, it's very sturdy, it's also archival. And it's actually really, really um, easy on smaller studios and, and it's not as, um, space intensive as like storing very large uh, canvases. Um, once I have the loose drawing on the uh, bristle board, bristle board, bristle, bristle board, um, I'll follow it up by shellacking the surface to seal um, the drawing. This is amber shellac. Um, and I stole this idea from Vincent Desiderio um, and also Norman Rockwell who also used shellac, but I think he used the clear shellac to seal his drawings before um, applying paint on top. The, I find that the amber shellac kind of tones the surface a bit um, so I can compare color. I have a hard time sometimes painting on a gray surface. Um, so I, I rather have the advantage of having sort of a colored surface that I can compare warm and cool colors to. And so to develop the painting, I kind of then, I kind of, uh, revert to using a more of an academic um, painting uh, method of steps where you go through your first painting, which largely consists of using, uh, using, earth, using an earth palette to sort of develop the warms and cools. And as you go to subsequent steps, you start incorporating more prismatic colors and more vibrant colors. Um, you can also see that <clears throat> as the painting progresses, I get more saturated. I get a little more sure about the shapes and colors that I'm using. You'll also notice that I like to have my palette actually on my painting surface. Um, the immediacy of using the painting surface as my palette has, has, always been, um, has always been efficient for me. It means that I have to do less turning around and I'm having my eyes off of the, off of the painting surface. I also don't transfer drawings. I find that something gets a little lost in the process. And eventually continue building up the painting until I get um, somewhat of a resolution as to um, a face or um, in some cases right now for this particular painting, I'm just sort of experimenting with um, seeing how much I can get away with using certain colors um, to push certain temperatures. So, when it comes to rendering, I used um, this method of what is called a one, two, three read to articulate rendered form. Um, I learned this technique um, through the teachings of Scott Robertson, a renowned educator and concept artist in the entertainment industry. And what um, Scott does is he utilizes this mathematical system to determine the relative numerical value relationships between light and shadow on the form. Um, I use this formula to create forms 
um, from imagination with um, somewhat of a respectable accuracy. You can always push the values once they're actually on the surface, but what this does is it allows me sort of a surefire way um, to get um, relative um, values that are accurate and actually mimic what happens in nature. So the term halfway to black is used to determine the shadow value of matte surfaces. Um, essentially, you take the true value of the surface and find a midway value between the darkest value. Um, that value provides a base for your shadow. Your darker half tones fall somewhere in between those two values that you plotted. So using halfway to black helps um, develop what I call, well, what we call a lighting strategy that you can use to sort of troubleshoot before mixing paint. So as you can see here, um, the color of the true value of the face is a seven. Halfway to that, halfway to the value black would be the value four. And the darker half tones would be in between that four and that seven, which is a 5.5. Now you can adjust any of these values, but this really helps in sort of giving you a baseline um, structure to your image so that you can sort of continue iterating and working on it. Um, here is an example of when I teach my students this method, how they're able to get results quite quickly. Um, um, this exercise, I gave a student um, an hour to do um, from start to finish, where they sort of create a still life setup. They do a quick drawing to sort of map out and sort of think about the values. And it actually, once there's something about seeing the numerical values next to each other that makes it so that you're more sensitive to those incremental steps between one value or another. Now, once you've got your setup, you can basically abandon the um, halfway to black and actually start pushing and pulling your lights and darks um, to push the kind of psychology that you want in the painting. So, Currently, I'm investigating um, formulas for um, mixing darker skin uh, values. And I've been looking at this artist quite closely. Her name is Margaret Bolin. And she, I call her sort of the soundtrack that I've been listening to lately. Um, she's one of the few contemporary painters who explores prismatic formulas for skin that speak closely to the kind of investigations that I've been um, doing. So I've been working on smaller works that explore flesh tones, particularly chromatic mixtures uh, um, between colors like alizarin crimson and uh, cadmium yellow light and cadmium yellow medium, um, rather than resort to the tried and true burnt umbers and the burnt siennas. Um, I also experiment with quite a few mediums to get texture in my paint, which I'll show you guys in a second. And so just to give you a basic rundown again of how this goes, um, this is sort of like the first pass on a painting where I'm painting basically directly from photo. Um, what I've started to institute now is I used to use Photoshop as a way to sort of including new elements, but I never really tried to use Photoshop to influence the colors that I would actually mix. And so um, these days what I'll do is I'll put a portrait into Photoshop and I'll actually start coloring on the portrait. I'm sort of making sort of a digital painting. I'm not really concerned with making a great painting as much as I'm concerned with seeing how much I can get away with using um, uh, colors that I typically don't use. And after developing the painting, I'll sort of have a final, um, and usually, I, so uh, one characteristic of most of my paintings is that they're almost never finished. I like the idea of sort of an undone painting because I like revisiting paintings even years after and sort of iterating on them some more. So uh, there, the, the other reason I use um, that I paint sort of these smaller paintings is because um, it's more like convenience. Um, I have larger works that I'm really I'm excited to start working on. And at the moment, um, because of my uh, current professional obligations as a full-time professor and now department head, um, I need to focus on those things and waiting, desperately waiting for the summers to come so I can um, re-engage in um, more larger uh, painting compositions that, en that encompass the kind of worlds that I think about and the kind of worlds that I imagine. So shall we paint? I'm gonna stop share. And 
Please mind me a second as I do a setup. So actually, before I do that, I'll show you guys a few tricks of the trade. So um, in my current studio setup, I use this device here um, as my easel. Um, this is a fully articulated easel. And it's quite convenient. Um, and that it allows me to work in sort of different modes and actually look at the piece um, from different angles to work. Um, if anyone is interested in this easel, I will put a link up on the chat. It's called the Artistic Easel. <clears throat> and here's obviously an image of um, a portrait that I'm gonna paint on. Here I kind of went overboard. Um, I went kind of overboard on the, the sketching phase um, of this. I typically don't go this detailed um, when drawing before uh, a painting. Um, the brushes that I used are from Rosemary and Company, which I swear by these brushes and I highly recommend them. Um, I can't state how, um, how important it is to use uh, really, really good materials, especially when in the learning phase of painting. And I'm only addressing this to people who are picking up painting who are in the in the conversation tonight. Um, using good materials is very, very important. <clears throat> and yes. Uh, so the panel I was talking about, this aluminum dye bond panel is the current panel that I use now when painting um, portraits. I like the rigidity of the surface. Uh, I also like its archivalness and the fact that it, it allows for um, just enough, um, just enough of a slickness when I'm painting, so that um, I can actually move paint around. I'm a I'm a very big fan of sort of sloshing paint around and kind of making a mess, letting it dry, and then coming back on top to make sort of corrections. What else do I have? Oh, and in terms of the mediums I use to paint. Um, this is a mixture of um, walnut um, alkyd oil and stand oil. So that's one medium. For a texture, I use liquid oleo and pasto um, to add a little more um, sort of texture and body to the paint. And one secret that I've been, um, that I just sort of stumbled upon a few months ago when painting is I'll take walnut alkyd um, medium um, if I want, if I want there to be less give in the paint, I'll take walnut alkyd medium and I'll put it on like um, I don't know a container or in this case a top, and I'll let it sit. I'll let it sit for like um, a day, and when it sits for a day, it becomes really, really tacky. And I'm actually and I'm actually able to use it to sort of make stiffer brush marks, or sometimes you'll get broken brush marks um, in the painting that allow for like really, really good texture. So that's a really good. Um, tip, um, I guess, that I can give to you all. Um, in terms of the brushes I use, um, I'm very dedicated to filbert brushes. I live and die by filbert brushes. I think um, the versatility in the filbert and the fact that um, I have a few uh, techniques that I teach. Um, I've actually named these techniques, uh, which help me um, organize my brush my brushwork um, when I'm painting. All right, and oops, I'm just gonna switch screens really quickly. All right, so in my presentation, I was talking about this idea of what halfway to black means. Um, the halfway to black method. So. Um, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six values. So we have six values here. If you want to, you can include white and that gives you seven values, right? So let's just say I started painting something and this was the uh, true value of a color. 
um, or true value of the object, the half way to black, and this is if I include black one, two, three, four, five, the half way to black for that value would probably be this color over here. So this would be the shadow value and this would be the light value. I probably use mixtures in here to create sort of my dark half tone, right? So please excuse me for my uh, terrible drawing, um, but so This is sort of like my uh, generic face here. Let's say the light is coming from this side. So sometimes I'll start a drawing or a painting um, like this. And so looking at my palette here, I can just assign a value. Let's just say I decide to assign it this value over one, two, three, four, five. So let's just say this is five. So this is going to be five. The shadow value, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Sorry, one, two, three, four, five. That shadow value would be here. One, two, three would be a three. So knowing that this is a five and this is a three, you can basically start painting. Oops. I'll try to open this. Oh, the pencil is actually mixing in with this, which is not. So here I'm just basically massing in. And massing in is basically getting, trying to quickly get those light and shadow relationships onto the surface. And this only, and this again, this serves as a foundation. You can always augment values later. What will affect the values of those shadows is the ambient light source or the background in this case. The darker the background, the darker your shadows will be. I should probably be demonstrating. So uh, when I paint, I think about um, usually when I'm painting, I paint across the form. My highlights, I almost always make my highlights sort of perpendicular. So in this case, if I'm painting across um, horizontally, my highlights are almost always perpendicular. I almost always use a tangential brush stroke to get the transitions in there. And I know we're pressed for time and I'm sort of overly um, simplifying some of these methods. Um, but if time were to commit or the opportunity, I'd love to um, engage with the uh, Providence Art Club in a, maybe a two-day workshop where we could really get into some of the more specifics of um, painting in this way. It starts, it starts off very rigidly, um, but eventually 
um, you kind of develop sort of a groove for going back and forth in terms of pushing, pulling different sort of painting concepts and ideas. So now when it comes to things like transitions, for instance, um, you can actually create half steps in between those And I'm just going to add a highlight in this case, just one step. I really hope this is coming clear on the screen here. And I'll explain what I'm doing here also. So um, this is more technical, but the head has sort of zones. It's sort of like more pale zone, this more red zone, and this sort of slightly cooler bluish and gray zone. And I'm just using this gray background here to sort of um, cre uh, create sort of a value between the surface that I'm painting on and the sort of looseness and the lightness of the paint. Um, to create that sort of cool zone. And here I'll probably go with a more paler zone uh, closer to the left, my left, your right, in this case, um, side of the painting to sort of add values. So this is usually um, how I start setting up my painting before I then um, wait for it to dry and start incorporating the more prismatic colors. Um, just quickly before I end, I know we're running out of time. Uh, my palette typically consists of titanium white, uh, cadmium yellow lemon, yellow ochre, uh, cadmium red, alizarin crimson, um, light red, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. Oops. Sorry about time, guys. Camera not working? Oh. Does anyone have any questions? First of all, that was great. Thank you so much, Eric. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, you should have like a television show on PBS where you paint. That was very relaxing to watch. Um, let's see. So I'm going to go into the chat and I'll pull out some questions. Um, so Sherry asked, what advantage do you find uh, with painting on aluminum? Your process makes me think of David Hockney's book, Secret. So I picked up the aluminum dye bond panel from another contemporary artist, uh, David Kassan, who um, who used it um, who used it mainly because of its rigidity. Um, I actually liked it um, because of space. <laughs> I can actually lay these painting downs very flat. So I have a wall right now with about eight paintings, and they're about the th and they're about the thickness of um, a very heavy duty canvas. So for me, it really is because it saves uh, because it saves space, and also I can manipulate I can I can manipulate the um, the ground a little more to either make it slick or to make it more absorbent. So I just really like the flexibility of you um, working on this panel. It's very expensive now. Um, you know, when I when I first purchased when I first purchased a few of these panels, um, they were a you know they were significantly cheaper. I think the price of these things probably went up by like fifty to sixty percent. So does it alter uh, your drying time at all using that kind of surface or, or does that matter at all? No, because I use the um, walnut alkyd medium. And so the if, if I'm painting on something, um, 
So if I'm if I'm if if I'm painting on a surface like um, this is about uh, this painting I did um, in about three or four sittings, and they really sort of the surface itself dried within 24 hours. Um, so it takes a while for me to actually start um, adding uh, other mediums like uh, stand oil um, mixtures onto the surface. I, I can get away with a lot by just using the walnut alkyd medium. That's fair. Cool. Uh, Terry asked, um, do you exclusively use oil or do you also use acrylic? I do not use acrylic. I'm terrible at acrylic. Um, most water-based paints, I'm just horrible at. Uh, I really envy those. Uh, I really envy people who can who can use watercolor. Um, I have a whole set of watercolors <laughs> that um, I'm I'm sort of terrified to use um, because I just get frustrated. Um, I'm also one of those like I can be very insufferable with how much I talk about how oil is like the epitome of greatness in painting. So I'm I'm a I'm a purist in a in the worst sense of the way. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, Janet said that she would love to hear what you named your filbert techniques. So uh, I teach this in my painting classes that I teach at RISD. So um, one of them, um, so I have like a, I have what is called like scraping um, and using scraping when using a tone canvas, uh, a tone canvas with a sort of cool color to create the sort of um, almost neutral turning that happens in painting um, faces. There's a technique called cutting that um, I also sort of, I kind of um, borrowed that technique from a late great artist who taught me at the academy by the name of Peter Cox, um, who, who, who talked about that. And uh, another technique that we use. Um, there's, a, there's sort of a scrubbing technique and the scrubbing technique happens where, um, so if you're trying to create soft gradations in skin um, where, you're, where you're not really trying to affect the value so much as you're trying to affect the temperature, um, you wait until the uh, walnut alkyd medium starts to get a little tacky. You use a very sort of like, like grungy or destroyed uh, hog hair bristle brush. And um, you can actually, or, or if you want to, you can actually also use a fan brush. Sort of, this is a, like a mangled fan brush. And you can actually sort of subtly scrape in subtle color into those transitions. That's great, thank you. Um, Nancy asked, how do you hang uh, your panels? So uh, at the moment, I have not, so, I don't handle those things. Usually what happens <laughs> is, is I send the painting off to like a, a, to a show if I'm participating. I've really participated in, in like group shows where I sort of turn the panel in and they find a way to sort of hang it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Michael is um, I'm looking at this frustrating going, yeah, it, it'd be great <laughs> if artists can actually figure out how to actually hang their work rather than leave it to um, the, the gallery. Um, but I, I, I've also seen other artists who um, get the surface uh, framed and develop a frame that also has sort of hooks in the back that you can actually hang the panel um, up. Well, you had the, the painting of the gentleman with the glasses. You had that in that show we did at the art club and it was very professionally put together. I had no problem with it, had a frame. <laughs> yes, um, someone actually, yeah someone, yeah, someone helped me with that. <laughs> My friend, someone helped me with frame. Someone definitely helped me with that frame. Um, Ali asked, curious about your process of leaving paintings to stew. Do you ever get anxiety or do the paintings ever cause any pressure to come back to them quickly? Um, how did you create that balance and boundary with your process? Ooh, good question. I suffer from major anxiety starting a painting. So it takes me a very long time to start a painting. I just start second guessing myself and thinking that I shouldn't even be drawing or painting in the first place. So it'll take me, it'll take me literally like an, if it's on like, if I have like time, like if I'm on vacation or on a weekend, it'll probably take me like maybe a couple hours to even touch the surface. Um, but once I get painting and I've made a mess, it's 
it's easier for me to sort of correct the mess than it is for me to sort of start a painting from scratch, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I like, I like being able to um, look at a painting and be able to measure and sort of draw lines to help me build um, measurements for finding the act, the inaccuracies and then painting on top of that. So one thing I do on my paintings is um, if I'm, if the goal is accuracy, then I'll continue measuring throughout the entirety of the painting. Um, wait till it dries, mark it up, and then paint on top. Cool. Um, let's see. Rebecca said, can you say more about your use of Photoshop and what digital tools in general do for you? So um, because I straddle between both digital illustration and fine arts, um, I've tried to I've tried to really try to find connections between both of them. I'm trying to find how one practice can inform the other. With Photoshop, it really comes down to color editing. So before Photoshop, um, as you can see in sort of like the earlier paintings I had, the pieces were they were very they were very baroque, meaning very strong shadows and very saturated. There was almost no subtlety in between. What Photoshop allowed me to do was go in there and use. Uh, different um, layer modes um, and also use different adjustment layers to adjust saturation and see where the possibility, you know, see what the possibilities could be. Um, one of my, again, one of my influences of Vincent Desiderio, I love his paintings for that because his, his paintings actually show a broader range with playing with different levels of saturation, um, um, different, different levels of color, I guess in digital sense, color modes to sort of create the depth in his paintings. So uh, Photoshop has really helped me um, edit paintings without committing to it on the canvas. It's really traumatizing for me when I'm painting something and I'll put, and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the palette itself and I'll look at the color and think this is the right thing. And I'll put it on a painting, especially during la the latter stages of a painting. And I realized it's the wrong value. It's the wrong color. Now I have to scrape this thing. Scraping this thing means that I won't get rid of all the paint. You know, it just turns into this almost traumatic experience and then you kind of lose all hope. So Photoshop really helps me um, mitigate a lot of those issues. That's great. Thank you. Um, Charles asked, uh, is most of your work figurative or do you have other subjects that you work with? I have committed to the figure. I'm a figurative mm -hmm. painter. I think I'll be a figurative painter until the end. Uh, the only time I, the only time I paint still lifes is when I'm teaching, like, the first semester of sophomore painting at RISD. And it's and it's, and and what's interesting about that is I'll see my students painting still lifes, and all of a sudden I'll fall in love with still lifes. I'm like, oh my gosh, I should be I should be painting still lifes. The not even the day after that semester is over, I never paint or look at another still life again. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, sort of an odd turn of events and experience. Interesting. Um, Terry asked, do you paint for pleasure or commissions? And if for commissions, how do you handle the stress of delivering and not letting your head get in the way? So I've only painted maybe two, whoa, three commissions. And uh, the thing is, is that because I didn't, I didn't, my career was never being a commission painter. I don't think I've ever really felt the stress of painting a commission. And that might be just naivety speaking. Um, I imagine that if someone were paying me large sums of money, I'd probably be very, very anxious about satisfying them. But the commissions I did, they were, um, I, had, I, I, I had far more control over sort of the lighting situation, the, the photographs I was taking, and the communication between us and working on the commissions was, was, was pretty seamless. And they were very open to sort of uh, changes and ways that I work. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Um, Amanda asked, what advice do you have for your students who struggle with color and color theory in their work? So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, my video seems to be, seems to be losing my video. Uh, I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? Sure. No, that's okay. What advice do you have for your students who struggle with color and with color theory in their work? 
So we, so I didn't talk about this during this presentation, but I also kind of have a uh, sort of a mathematical equation for figuring out color as well. So I struggled with this as, you know, I, I struggled this with this. I struggled with this as a student when I attended RISD um, because RISD, you know, RISD's curriculum um, when I was a bachelor's degree was so. Um, it was very open and it, and it really um, left students um, free to kind of discover and find their own ways of making. And I realized that at the time when I was a student, I needed sort of far more structure. I kind of needed steps. And so I felt that as long as you gave me the steps, then I could sort of decide which parts of the process I wanted to keep and which process, which part of the process I wanted to sort of um, leave behind. And that's sort of what I do now with my practice. There are certain artists I'll look at and I'll say, well, I like what they do here, so I'll take that. And I like what this artist does here, and I'll take that. But when it comes to color, the most important aspect of color is always going to be value. Um, I rely on the Munsell system, the Munsell system, and I'll use, I'll use chromatic grays to adjust value and saturation of the colors I choose. I also, um, I also learn how to appreciate how every color out of the tube has, um, is specific to a unique value and, and to some degree memorizing what those values are. So for example, um, a, cadmium, a cadmium red um, might have the value of a five or a middle value five. Uh, cadmium, I'll choose an extreme color like a cadmium uh, yellow light might have on a zero to 10, might have a value of a, maybe a, maybe a seven or an eight. And so if I mix a value five and I mix a value eight, I might get I might five, eight, I might get a value seven, right? And so once I have that value seven, then I'll alter the sort of saturation. So I think of the, I think of color in numbers. Right in terms of adjusting for a particular, so once I once I get that value, and in this case, let's just say I get an orange. Orange is going to have a numerical value, right, on the color on the color on the color scale, and then I'll adjust the saturation. I hope that makes sense. I think that's a very helpful way of thinking about it. That's cool. Um, let's see. Monica asked, "Was your process different when you were working in the entertainment industry?" Ooh, I mean, I mean, in the so the halfway to black is definitely um, used quite often um, um, in in the industry for sort of predicting values and predicting color. So that was definitely used. I would say um, they can be quite mutually exclusive um, because with Photoshop, uh, so many things you know, so many tools sort of automate the experience for you. I think having a traditional and analog background helps give your work um, nuanced sensibilities that allow for sort of more artistic expression to show. Um, but I would say in terms of in, in, in the digital landscape all right, that existed in the entertainment industry is pretty conformist. There's sort of a way you do things and that's really based on time and efficiency. It's not really based on artistic expression that you find in sort of fine arts practice. That's great. Thank you. Um, Nancy said, uh, in your bio, I mentioned uh, the, a visual book that you were working on. Can you talk more about that project? Oh, so I am working on, I don't have, uh, oh, actually, yeah. oh, so it's behind me. Um, this, is a, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a graphic novel that I've been working on um, for too long. Um, now, uh, it takes place in a fictional um, Brazilian uh, city, and it's about the demise of a friendship uh, between two uh, lifelong friends. It's supernatural, um, it's a thriller, and it involves uh, almost a sort of juvenile boy logic. It sort of gives, I, I wanted to give my readers um, sort of a glimpse into um, some of the friendships I've had and how they sort of came to an end. That's great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the rosemary brushes. Um, David was wondering, do you have any preference for oil brands? 
Oh, so for um, I I use various brands, um, certain colors, certain colors. So there are certain colors you might want to you you know you, you might want to pony up the money <laughs> to get. Um, you know, certain colors I'll choose sort of an, an, an old Holland brand. Um, for the most part, uh, I've been working with Winsor Newton and and Gambling colors, uh, but those three would probably be the ones that I've worked with in the past. Uh, currently, like meaning right, in, you know, sort of as of as of 2021, I've almost entirely switched to Vasari paints. Um, I think Vasari paints are, you know, they're quality paints. They last you long, and <clears throat> I just really like the ratio of um, uh, pigment to oil that 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 they that they have in their paints. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and then and then a lot of people were also commenting in the chat. The idea of you doing a workshop is very exciting. So we'll have to uh, we'll get Abba Cudney to get in touch with you so we can talk about doing a two day workshop. Uh, and then there's just a bunch of like thank yous in the chat. Um, if you could, I don't know if you want to put it in the chat now, or if you want to send me the link about uh, your easel, and I could circulate. Oh, that sure. Too. Actually, I can. Um, sorry, guys. No, I that's okay. Should have had that. I'll put that in the in the chat right now. Uh, oops, is it not going through? Oh, yeah. There it is. And uh, uh, this is for rosemary brushes. Great, thank you so much. There's also, um, I believe there's also a discount code that you can use for the um, art easel. You can probably, you can find it in a video on YouTube where they sort of talk about using it. It's pretty expensive. I, I think it's a worthy investment for me um, because I have a sort of smaller studio space right now. And <clears throat> the larger paintings that I'm gonna be working on are about 48 inches by 30 inches. And I think this, uh, this, uh, this easel sort of supports that size. So it, it sort of works for me. And also because I can actually stand up. So I can, um, you can sort of work on this standing up oh, cool. sort of facing down on the on the on the painting especially if you have a painting that is uh sort of droopy um you can kind of like raise it so that you can kind of cause minimal sort of harm to the rest of the painting that's awesome yeah this was really really great eric thank you so much lots of so much to think about from art history to your taking us into your studio really really awesome um oh and then annie had one more question which is for illustrations, are you doing those in oil or digitally? Uh, almost all my illustrations are exclusively digital, um, and um, fine arts painting is 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 oil. Um, and it's it's interesting uh, when, when I talk to a lot of my colleagues who I graduated with from RISD. Some of them find that you know digital is is clean, you know, it's very efficient. They can sort of continue working in digital. I don't think I, I imagine a scenario where I would ever give up oil painting. So, um, you know, oil painting is, is this, um, you know, when I oil paint, I don't want to be too rigid. I like being able to kind of push and pull and grab, you know, different resources to sort of help build um, the experience. That's great. Thanks again. This was awesome. And for everyone, um, all of our Providence Art Club lectures are free and open to the public, and we have a bunch more planned. So keep on our mailing list and keep in touch with us, and you'll see more lectures forthcoming. But I thank Eric. This was such a great, I'm so jealous of your students. I feel like they must be learning so much. It's very cool. Um, and thank Actually, you. I would, I, I would, oh, I, I would say I learned, I learned far more from my students than I don't, than I would, than I imagine they learned from me. Really? Um, I, I really, I really enjoy working at RISD and teaching and teaching at RISD. You're just sort of um, constantly running into some of the most like brilliant minds, uh, creative people. You know, uh, I, I would push back on that. I'd say I learned far <laughs> more from my students than they probably learned from me. That's great. Well, thank you again for joining us. This was really fun. I think we all learned a lot and I hope you all have a great night. No, thank you all.